Hello to everybody. I'm Susan Asadi. I'm the executive director of the Global Chamber in New York City, and I wanted to welcome you um, today or this evening, um, whatever time zone you're in, to the Global Chamber. Um, if you're not familiar with us, we are a growing global community of CEOs, executives, and leaders in 525 metro regions around the world, pretty much everywhere. And I'm so grateful that you've taken some time out of your day or evening from wherever you are to join us. Um, if you're not one of the speakers, as I said a few minutes earlier, if you could please mute your microphone until the end of the formal program, or we're going to have some time for Q&A from the attendees. So the Global Chamber is focused on helping companies grow within and across metro areas all around the world. And we are the only organization with hundreds of locations that helps executives grow sustainable business through warm connections and virtual services and doing programs like the one we are today. Our, our objective is to make it as easy for you to do business across the world as it is doing business across the street. So um, today we're focused on real estate, a springboard into transforming the shape of the public realm. And um, we hope to address the history of the public realm and how it's transformed over the decades. And we seek to discuss the role real estate plays in shaping the urban landscape, fostering livable cities, creating community development, promoting sustainability. <clears throat> First off, I wanna thank Bernadita Calaneo, founder of Walkspan, who helped me put this panel together today. She's been very helpful and a very active member in the New York City chapter. So thank you, Bernadita. She's one of our speakers and is joined by Barry Hirsch, a clinical professor at New York University School of Professional Studies, Shack Institute of Real Estate. If you can raise your hand, Barry, I think everybody sees your name. And Lenny Schwendinger, who's the creative director of Light Projects. Um, and I wanna also thank one of our partners, Nancy Plager, who helped introduce me to Lenny. So thanks all around. Thank you for joining us today, Nancy. So each one of our speakers will take about seven to 10 minutes, some want it a little longer than others. And then we will follow with a few questions I put together for them. And we do welcome your questions. So if you can begin to think about them, you can either queue them up in the chat or once we finish the formal program, um, I'll reach out to you to ask a question. And just once again, if you've just joined, please make sure to mute your mic so that the speakers can present. So um, first up, um, not in order of importance, but in order of the program, Barry Hirsch. Um, he's a clinical professor at NYU School of Professional Studies, Shack Institute of Real Estate, where he founded the Master's in Real Estate Development Program. He teaches courses in sustainable real estate development, infrastructure and urban redevelopment, as well as land use and environmental regulation. He conducts research on innovative urban real estate um, and is a core faculty member of the NYU Center for the Sustainable Built Environment and the NYU Urban Lab. In addition to working with faculty and curriculum, his student mentorship includes successful national competition teams. And he has served in numerous NYU leadership roles, including as vice chair of the NY School of Professional Studies Faculty Council and as a member of the NYU Faculty Senate. In summer 23, um, Professor Hirsch received two awards for his work in brownfield redevelopment, the first for a lifetime thought leadership and the second at the 15th annual Northeast Sustainable Community Workshop. So um, in 2022, he was named a member of the United States Environmental Protection Agency Environmental Financial Advisory Board, which recently helped formulate greenhouse financial programs. So without further ado, Barry, if um, you want to speak to us and maybe if you can make your slide a little bit bigger, it might be good for the audience. I'll try. <laughs> uh, I'm not gonna, I, they're just images. We, I'll leave it, I don't wanna spend time playing with it. Okay, um, okay. Uh, let me see if I can wait to see. Maybe that's a little better. Yeah, at the bottom, there's a bar where you can, at the very bottom right, where you can make the image a little bit larger. There you go. Okay, excellent. Thank you. There we go. Okay. okay. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, great pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been working in the public realm uh, for quite a while, and you'll see that my focus is often on sites that were something else. There's, of course, a, a long history 
to the uh, uh, the public realm, going back to Greece and Rome and agoras and forums. Uh, but today they have a special focus, partly because of post-COVID reactions and also because of the way in which we use space and the way in which we do all kinds of things in the public realm. We are talking about uh, public open space, meaning it is open to the public. They are uh, civic places. Um, and there's actually uh, a lot of history and th thought to it. Uh, Jane Jacobs in uh, Death and Life in Great American Cities talked about streets and the public realm. Um, William Holly White, uh, who actually did some work here at NYU, uh, The Social Life of Small Urban Spaces, and uh, Nathaniel Owings as in Skidmore Owings in Maryland, The Spaces in Between, the first book with that title, are all talked about the importance and how people actually use space. There are a lot of functions. It's a meeting space. They're often associated with food, restaurants, vendors, markets. Uh, there are certainly retail activities. Uh, there are boutiques. There are kiosks. There's all kinds of things that attract people to these kind of spaces. Um, the images I'm showing are two that I've had some involvement with. Uh, in East Toledo, which is actually across the river from uh, downtown Toledo, that is a park uh, that was created where there was a steel mill. So a heavy industrial site, now public use. Uh, the other one is better known is the High Line uh, that runs for a mile and a half on the west side of Manhattan. It has become one of the top visitor venues uh, actually in the world. Um, I actually worked on economic study and we said it would be a great success, but we underestimated it. How much people like strolling along. There are most of the restaurants and things like that are actually underneath it. And one of the things about these uh, uh, open spaces, they can be on grade. Uh, there are uh, examples like the High Line which are above grade. And there are even some that are uh, below grade, sunken plazas, et cetera. <laughs> there are a lot of contributing factors, why people like these spaces, why people use these spaces. Uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the orientation, the sunlight, uh, as a below grade example, the San Antonio Riverwalk. Um, we're going to talk a little bit later about how people get there. Uh, what's the design? What's the street furniture? Um, as I mentioned, I am particularly interested in adaptive reuse, where these kind of spaces will want something else. And of course, they have to be safe and secure. Someone has to administer them, make sure they're clean. Uh, the idea of the public realm is a way to bring people together in a way that they enjoy. Uh, and the waterfront sites mentioned could also include the San Antonio Riverwalk as one that's below grade, have become uh, enormously popular. They're paid for in a lot of different ways. If it's a public park, often municipality. Sometimes there are business improvement districts where the adjoining uh, private properties uh, uh, pay a tax. Uh, there are sometimes venues. There are all kinds of different ways in which they are funded. And who puts them together? Well, the architects, landscape architects, engineers, lots of public officials and planners. Uh, and the way in which they come together involves many city agencies from sanitation to police uh, to a number of, you know, to, and we'll talk about lighting later. Uh, uh, a few of the examples, uh, additional examples, there are actually places called Times Square on several continents. 
there's a, there is one in Shanghai, there's one in Tokyo, as well as, of course, the one in New York. Some are much smaller spaces, small town square. Uh, one of my favorites, Litchfield, Connecticut. Uh, seaports, Boston, Lower Manhattan, Baltimore. Also uh, examples in uh, the Netherlands. Clyde Warren Park in Dallas is another brownfield site. Guestworks Parks in Seattle. These are all places that had a different function and now function as the public part of the public realm and that people love and use. So with that, I'm going to turn it over. We have two real experts on creating of the public realm and I'll let them proceed. Thank you. And put any questions in chat for me. Okay, so you can uh, take your screen down if you could. Um, okay. Thank you so much. I'm sure we're gonna have some questions for you after. Um, Lenny Schwendiger is our next speaker. She's a published award-winning authority on issues of city lighting with more than 20 years of worldwide experience creating sustainable illuminated environments. This work is shared through Lenny's public speaking and envisioning engagements, including the International Night Seeing uh, Navigate Your Luminous City program, which she uh, will lead us through today. Her urban lighting projects can be experienced at sites such as parks, subways, and bridges. She directs the International Nighttime Design Initiative, establishing a new interdisciplinary profession. Projects for the initiative include smart lighting guidance for New York State and developing innovative pilots with think tank new urban mobility. Le Lenny is also a visiting research fellow at the London School of Economics. So Lenny, do you wanna share your screen with us? You need to unmute, you have to unmute. Oops. Okay, hold on. I was just saying I lost my presentation, but that um, okay. Okay. bit of time helped. I'm going to get this up. I know. All of us with technology, we should be patient with one another. Pretty good at it. All right, here we go. Let's go. Okay. All righty. Move that beautiful pes pesky beautiful. toolbar. Okay, where's Okay, sorry, is that, you know, that toolbar thing with Zoom? All right, moving that. Okay, here we go. Beautiful. Hello, everyone, and thank you to the Global Chamber. I um, thank Nancy Plager, who's in the audience. Uh, I was kind of really interested in being invited to this uh, Globinar to talk about real estate. It's not something I usually talk about, but thankfully... Uh, we've angled towards public space, the public realm, which Barry has so well defined for us. I wanted to start, I, I think often that, you know, my audiences aren't all that experienced with lighting. So I wanted to start by talking about what, what is urban lighting um, and where did it come from? Um, not 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 the Romans and, and the Greeks, but that Barry mentioned, but rather sort of more the Western uh, part of our globe. What I really love about the old posters and the ideas of how to light cities on the left, you have moonlighting from Austin, which was just, gee, the moon lights our night. So let's just use one lighting fixture and light everything. Well, it's a very romantic idea and it's a great idea, except that doesn't really work. And um, so then streetology from GE comes forward and sort of posits this idea of lighting as a symbol of forward thinking, a symbol of progress. And I love that. I want, do you want to point out, however, that, um, you know, there's all kinds of opinions about uh, public lighting or urban lighting. And in the 19th century, originally, you know, people felt the bad guys are out at night under the cover of darkness. Why would we add light to enable them to do more bad things? And um, by the 20th century, when we started to have a rollout of real public lighting, um, it was argued that scenes of lewdness and debauchery would be 
reduced. So there are always different points of view on the public realm and how we should treat it. And I always, I like to mention that you may disagree with your neighbor and then in a few years from now, everything will change in terms of the points of view about nighttime and lighting. So we've just um, started Night Sense. I came from Barcelona at the Smart Cities World Expo to discuss smart lighting. And Night Sense is something you might want to look up. The points that are our pedestals are increasing safety and welcome. Safety always comes first. It's sort of the ground that we walk on. And that's why it's first at the bottom. And legibility helps people feel confidence. Now, I want you all to put your dark hat on, okay? When I'm speaking, I'm always talking about nighttime. So let's all put on our nighttime hats and go into public health. Public health, for example, is extending the hours of walkability, which I know Bernadito is going to talk about some more. Um, that's physical health. So if we extend safety and inspiration into the night, people will walk more. Also, sociality, as they say, social encounters are very important, and we can have those at night out of doors. Finally, we want to augment economic vitality. You know, when we were first starting these pillars, um, we realized, oh my gosh, Concerts, movies, theater happen after dark. They're a real kind of uh, anchor to nighttime activities and economic vitality. So there's retail with later offer, uh, later opening hours. There's cultural offerings after dark. Once we start to think about nighttime and nighttime design, we begin to realize that holistic after dark strategies are important for cities, especially those cities who are trying to attract younger uh, residents. We found that, you know, nightlife is important. And this whole idea, this sort of uh, real estate idea of the 24 hour city is grabbing hold more and more these days. And um, I think we need to create healthy, vibrant, all night design through lighting. Now you might think, well, gee, how about just a little more light? Done. We're done. Just more light. How do you do that, Lenny? And I have to say that Monash University with my old firm, Arup, did a wonderful study on younger women and their points of view about lighting. And the summary for this uh, study is layered nuanced, careful lighting is much better than the flood lit effect, which just feels like jail. So be a little bit careful if you are, if you care about the gendered public space and everyone's safety. Who are my clients? The citizens, the people who occupy the night. That's everyone from shift workers. I have a big focus on night shift and the nightlife, people who want to be out at night, people who must be out at night. And how do we make public space easy to navigate, feel like freedom, and inspiring? So who else do we work for in public space? You know, remember, we're outdoors. I'm a lighting designer for public space, not your kitchen. Who do we work for? We work for city agencies, real estate developers, planners, transportation. And um, are the people we have to convince to do better public lighting. Who do we work with? We work with uh, design teams. We select the best professionals who will help us from social researchers who will help us understand the occupants of our neighborhoods to urban designers who are the best city designers, transportation experts. Are we going to close the street down for a night market? Are we going to have a special lane for sanitation? 
these street designers and transportation experts are very important. I want, I want to apologize for my bird. She never chirps while I talk. <laughs> okay, here we go. So first mile, last mile, I hope you've heard of this. It's a whole idea of how people get to and from work and transit to home and transit. In other words, back and forth to destinations after dark. And I have a quick itinerary. I'm going to kind of race through this safety, directionality, attraction, and respite. So these are real photographs that I took and we removed the lighting and then added it back in for before and after photos. This is up in the Bronx and the easiest darn thing ever, an LED strip stuck onto the roller where the roller shade comes down. And then look at the subway right here and how welcoming and important that light is. I call these uh, bodegas or vegetable stands a point of respite, a point we're walking to. If you're a woman with kids and schlepping bundles of things, you want to see an illuminated space, shop, laundromat, something up ahead for respite and legibility. Orientation and signs are so important, whether it's a kiosk or the Empire State Building. Again, I can see my way forward by these illuminated breadcrumbs of light. Belisha beacons are in Europe and especially in the UK. I don't understand why we do not have them. From a distance, you can tell where the zebra crossings or crosswalks are and you feel so much safer when you get to the crosswalk and it's illuminated. This is a favorite. These are pools of light that help us understand how long the sidewalk is. These are, again, the kind of illuminated breadcrumbs. An illuminated doorway is a friendly doorway. And this is private light. So they didn't light their doorway with the understanding that, gee, we'll make it easier for people to navigate the sidewalk or the pavement, but it does help us find our way. This is my magic one. So this is a hospital in London and with this great transparent, colorful decal. Again, a private institution lends more vitality to public lighting. So we have both the agency and the city's lighting, but we also have private lighting. This is in um, in Brooklyn, 82nd Street area. And here we have a little food truck. I love the food trucks as, again, um, places to stop, places of respite, places to feel safe. And then the market in Seattle, which is a great, huge night market. Again, a nighttime activity we can go out to. So how do we analyze the night? How do we know how to move forward with public lighting or urban lighting? One thing is pilots and labs, as well as engagement. So this is Shades of Night which we invented to measure the night. So as soon as it gets dark, we have some kind of after work activity. Let's say it's winter, could be as early as five. People who are either working at home come out of their homes. People are at offices, come out of their offices. In any case, the night ascends or descends, depending on your point of view. So the after work activity could be shopping, could be going to the gym, could be going home, could be going to the night shift. After work at recreation could be a cocktail or it could be playing basketball, depending on your night occupants. Night shift actually begins the third shift at around 11 or midnight. So I like to think of people who are just getting up, going out to work and it would be only fair to have safe, 
welcoming night environments for these people. And then they wake up. And meanwhile, sorry, then they, they get off work. It may still be light, sorry, dark out. And I believe we should have some restaurants with dinner for them. After hours recreation, this is really clubbing. So the clubbers are going out at around 1 a.m., depending on your city and geography. Early risers, runners, people going to work, commuting, walking dogs, and dawn. So we measure these nights with the Shades of Night protocol, which includes lighting and those who are on the streets, interviews, why are you here? What are you doing? How does it feel? So community engagement is very important. Working together with kids, adults, um, locals who are experiencing the night and can learn more about it. So a lot of times we do our analysis with um, locals. Sometimes we invent pilots this Lantern was invented in Cartagena in Colombia, where we worked with the locals to create locally bespoke lanterns that fit Cartagena. So, for example, in terms of engagement, this guy here, I'm pointing to this middle guy in the foreground, is an economist. In the background, we have cultural ambassador from an indigenous um, society. We have government. We have a graphic designer. We can fling our, our doors wide for engagement. That usually leads to a master plan of light. So let's do some planning here. Let's define the different areas of lighting um, on our streets so that we can apply creative lighting. This is nighttime night seeing, which I just finished in Barcelona. I've done this all around the world. It's a real platform for understanding the night goes along with the shades of night, where we work with people improving their cities, first by the night seeing walk. Here is a master plan. So this is the mayor on the upper center image, often walking with mayors, and then a master plan that shows the different routes, shows should we should we light public art should we light the port should we light the monuments what should our streets look like after dark here is another um, roadmap for illumination and community building with the 82nd street partnership again community engagement is key so the process for our nighttime design which is part and parcel of lighting and engineering and architecture and community engagement. It's a real team process. Starts with envisioning, goes to strategies. Let's do some pilots, design individual projects and implement them. So finally, let me show a few slides of creative lighting. This is in Las Vegas. This is here in Manhattan on 42nd Street to the Port Authority, 41st Street over 9th Avenue. Um, in Seattle, an immersive experience at the Opera House. And in San Diego, this, I said, couldn't be done, that the, the um, those who had the power and authority to say yes or no would never agree to these 30-foot compound curve streetlights, and yet there they are. That's me. Okay, Lenny, thank you. Very thorough, um, beautiful lighting. Very exciting. Well, thank you. So I'm sure we're gonna have some questions for you as well. So um, next up, um, Bernadita Calanea, the founder of Walkspan, is a human ecologist and environmental planner who's passionate about urban livability, walkability, and sustainability. She's directed over 35 environmental and sustainable development studies for multi-million dollar infrastructure investment projects in the US, and abroad through the creative use of location intelligence to map environmental impacts and develop mitigation measures. Several of her projects have received awards for engineering excellence. So 
without further ado, Bernadita, please share with us more about Walkspan and what you do. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Yeah, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Global Chambers and Susan. So I'm extending the conversation on the public realm and real estate. I mean, um, uh, the talks before me were amazing. There are a few overlaps, which is wonderful. And I think like there's a lot of synergy and understanding among us about what the public realm is. And so I'll just start by giving extending more definition types, the demand for public realm, elements of the sidewalk trends, benefits, the challenges that we have now, and real estate as a springboard and conclusion. So, so the public realm to me is my, the definition that I like the most is that it is a natural and built environment between and within buildings used by the public daily, regardless of ownership, affecting our city's livability, safety, health, and sustainability. So it is actually what defines um, the, the public realm in the or the cities rather in the sense that both the character and the quality of the public realm is what we experience um, going from one place to one city to another. And so there's several types of pops are also called the uh, private owned public spaces or alleys, waterfronts, um, uh, gardens and all that. But to me, the closest to my heart is are, are the sidewalks. Like in New York City, for example, we have about 9,000 uh, linear miles of sidewalks, and that translates to about 680,000 miles of, of uh, 680,000 miles of blocks. And so the, that is the topic that is closest to my heart. And, and the demand in the US, for example, Americans, 78% of them are willing to pay for walkable communities. That's a very recent study by NAR. And another study showed that $225 billion will, is a projected annual revenue of walkable neighborhoods in the 21st century. And brokers and um, and real estate agents um, can gather around on average 24% of premium in walkable for homes in walkable neighborhoods. So most planners look at um, at sidewalks like so, but obviously some are narrower than others and, and some are nicer than others. But in essence, the sidewalk is not just the walk zone where people walk. Clearly that is a non-negotiable um, a zone where you, it has to be free of obstructions, no cracks, no bumps, no holes, so people can safely walk through. But when you walk in the sidewalks of New York City, for example, there's the building edge. And if it's all uh, blocks of concrete, it can be very cold and, and uninviting. There's the frontage where you have benches and uh, gar flowers and flower pots and so on. And the furnishing zone is also where you see lighting and garbage bins and all that. And now um, we have more sidewalk extensions and obviously the crosswalk. So globally, there are there is a huge trend in many, many cities. And recently, the Netherlands have uh, started putting trees in their cities. They're calling their cities the walking forest, which is very exciting. And in Barcelona, they have this thing called the super blocks where they do not allow cars to go through uh, many of the of parts of the cities. New York City's open street program has expanded and they even assigned a chief of public realm, which is a first. And in Paris, they have this prestigious award for their 15 minute city where they encourage the design of cities where you find everything within a 15 minute walk and not needing uh, a car for any reason. Uh, technology wise, I mean, for the public realm, when even artificial intelligence has come up with many tools like simulations of what your sidewalk can look like. And you can just type up some image um, thoughts that you want and see that the sidewalk can transform like so. And just like what um, Lenny showed, some technologies for lighting crosswalks, a lot of um, kids walk and like millennials walk streets without even looking up and they have their um, iPhones on and, and so that the lighting helps them with um, crossing. So 
benefits we've also heard why it's good for your health it's good to reduce climate change it's good for economic recovery and community engagement there are however a lot of challenges and these are actually quite recent you, uh, i will share a few um information about some articles and newspapers recently about desolation conversion fragmentation and jurisdiction now this is a cover page in the um, uh it's it the I'm I'm forgetting the Wall Street Journal sorry and it says America's downtowns are empty fixing them will be expensive their lonely sidewalks and closed storefronts inspire proposals to recast office districts into neighborhoods where people live work and raise families so this is one current challenge going on and um, some other statistics include 50,000 retail shops could close in the next five years. Food traffic in the U.S. is down by 26 percent and office retail price is down by 50 percent. And we we all see this as we walk the sidewalks, lots of shops that are closed and so on. And in New York, Manhattan, for example, the vacancy rate is of more than 22%, and this all started since COVID time, and is just still uh, having difficulty with recovery. If we have the map of, of New York City, and the foot traffic has gone down in Midtown by 23%, Lower Manhattan by 18%, and so on. Some places have increased, but these are morely have that suburb feel like the Bronx Hub and, and Jamaica, Forest Hills, and so on. Now, when it comes to conversion, there's also a big challenge because they found out that only about 20% of the buildings in Manhattan are easy conversion candidates. So, and the reason is because these commercial buildings have windows all around, but what happens in the middle, you know, um, the, it's very dark. I mean, people need lighting and there's no light, um, possibility in the middle of most of these commercial buildings. And even with that, only like about 5% easy conversion candidates that are 50% vacant. So, so this is the current situation on nationally right now, even San Francisco. Uh, most of these buildings are really the, the low rise buildings as opposed to the very high rise, which are the ones that are difficult to convert. Fragmentation, this is a um, typical situation in any planning experience where there are a lot of projects that are going on uh, from in one part of the city to another, and they're all very exciting, but what about the network that connects them? What happens to those sidewalks and streets that are not part of the, the plan on all of these um, very important urban projects? So this is a real challenge that I guess, I believe needs to be addressed. The other problem, of course, is jurisdiction. The ownership of the sidewalk in New York and many other cities is belongs to the city. And as Lenny had mentioned, there's the Department of Sanitation, Police, Parks and Recreation, and DOT that are all involved in managing the sidewalk. So that that's where the difficulty comes. And then, but then the maintenance is assigned to the adjacent property. They have to read themselves of obstructions, refuse and repair. And actually even recently Taylor Swift's uh, apartment in, in New York City was fined because she left a lot of trash on in front of her building. So nobody spared. And so what about real estate as springboard? So I think that the, the challenge is both the, our situation with the public realm, but also the, the real um, challenges shape uh, experienced by real estate right now, especially commercial real estate. And so I think that one of the, the springboard could be that the real estate should focus not only on the building, but on place, that they have to embrace the sidewalk. They have to consider it as part of, of the, the, the area. So, and then they could also focus on low cost sidewalk upgrades. It doesn't have to be a major intensive government funded infrastructure. If you put benches, if you put um, flower planters and, and even put, um, nice signage and all that and umbrellas and all that will really make a difference in staging the front of your 
of the sidewalk. Think corridor improvements as opposed to just uh, little parks and places. So think um, corridors, empower building owners to stage sidewalks. Real estate people are very, very good at staging interior buildings, but they can extend that in many cities, like as even Jane Jacobs would mention, the, the streets should be playgrounds for children. It's your extended living room. You know, um, he, she even coined the name sidewalk ballet um, for, for um, sidewalk corridors and establish imperatives, meaning what must we have, not just things that are nice to have, and also use tools for comprehensive sidewalk assessment. So here, for example, um, New York City's rethinking Fifth Avenue, bringing in more people into the public realm, and so that greater foot, uh, foot traffic will, will be. Um, infrastructure is very, very little. You can put low cost sidewalk upgrades like benches and umbrellas, and that will help a lot. And imagine when, um, Harlem has the widest sidewalk in New York City, wider than the High Line, and they could do some small upgrades or large upgrades to that to make it a better place for walking, empower building owners to stage sidewalks, uh, establish sidewalk imperatives. This to me is the most important because hopefully it will translate into regulations, into law where every sidewalk has to be beautiful with trees and, and furniture. It has to be safe. It has to be comfortable, useful, equitable, accessible. It has to be vibrant and extendable. And then for um, Ma uh, assessment methods. There are tools right now. This is Walkspan has created a method where you, we score the sidewalks. We score the sidewalk feel where how do you feel as you walk along the sidewalk and sidewalk gem score because what you see as you um, are uh, walking in the sidewalks and then we we score the sidewalks accordingly as I mentioned. So in conclusion, uh, real estate recovery through public realm transfer transformation will offer an opportunity to make life better. The photo below is the high line. So uh, Barry started with the high line, I end with the high line, but the right photo is the view from the high line. And so another conclusion, why can't we take the high line to the low line? I mean, they underestimated the benefits that it could have brought I think they were looking at 250 million and they were in the billions, two billion in terms of economic recovery. And just as an example, the meatpacking district where the High Line is has space availability only at 5% and all of Manhattan is 20%. So there's a lot of lesson to be learned in corridor improvement and transforming and envisioning how sidewalks should look like without necessarily affecting the flow uh, of traffic and the safety. Thank you so much. Thanks, That's Bernadita. That was an excellent presentation. Um, all right. So I'm going to go pretty quickly some questions because we have at least two questions that have already been queued up from the attendees. So I want to make sure we have some time for that. So um, one question um, I had that it was addressed a bit and already by all the speakers, particularly Barry, but what has been the catalyst to improving in the focus on the public realm? Barry, do you want to add anything to that? What's been the catalyst to the improvement? The, the catalyst for some of these projects has been, um, in some cases, the local businesses, business improvement districts, where people actually voted to pay a little bit more on their property tax because they wanted more street traffic. And there has been some that have been extremely successful. Uh, sometimes it's a concept. Uh, the story on the High Line was was going to be torn down. And two, uh, I'll mention NYU alums, were at a public hearing and met and decided that was a bad idea and were able to convince eventually uh, the powers that be, including the planning commissioner and the, the mayor, uh, to save the High Line. So there are, it, it can come from a lot of different places, almost always local. Okay. Thank you. Um, Lenny or Bernadita, do you have anything to add to that? So I, I, I'm thinking that um, 
that we're all scared of climate change because it is a real thing and it's a real problem and and climate change would it would be nice if we can use that as a catalyst to make the cities greener because it's going to help the city in in reducing the both the heat island effect and also um stormwater management and and of course the um, the climate change so that that to me is a very significant uh, opportunity for to be a catalyst for public realm improvement among other things okay lenny do you have anything else to add on that okay okay all right um so the next question is um what is the impact of sustainability on your work um so bernadita you want to lead off on that and then maybe lenny would have a comment on that as well yeah, I can, I can. I guess it's similar to my answer previously, but the just the news yesterday, it said the U.S. is warming the earth 60% faster than the rest of the world. And so um, to me, I think like I'm an environmental planner. So my focus on, on the public realm is really to make cities more livable, but also more sustainable, but, and also the impacts both on environment and social have to be really, really significant, and the public realm can be a wonderful platform to do that. So so that to me, would it's very, that's why I'm very excited about my business and the work that I do. Okay. Yeah. Lenny, did you want to add something? Yes, definitely. And I was sort of working on an answer for the one question about measuring success that oh, was in, in the okay. chat. But okay. you know, this is this is a good uh, lead into that. So the sustainability question, you know, it's it's pretty broad. I, I love the way Bernadita kind of defined. Well, what is what is the public realm? You know. Um, so for me, there's kind of this sustainable community, which is a community that is is vital and and they feel livable it feels livable they're they're happy to invest in in their neighborhood and and it's agreeable okay so i want to add nighttime to that now the first step with new street lighting really is uh, converting to led i mean apparently we're around 70 percent in in our country conversions um automatically, you know, you don't even have to talk about it, but automatically we've reduced our carbon footprint and the expense of uh, lighting for a city or uh, whoever owns the street lights. And um, after that, if you supply the lighting with um, smart capabilities or adaptive, we call it adaptive cap capabilities, that allows us to measure, um, met create metrics around pollution, parking, um, you know, all kinds of city services. And it allows us to analyze those services and then change and improve the streetscape. So right there, you're also saving a heck of a lot of money. Um, the lights report back to a base and say, I'm broken. And then you don't have to send out the guys trawling, looking for broken street lights. It saves tons of money. Um, so that's on the sort of saving money side benefit. But I also think that the sustainable community side is, is, you know, a uh, happy community, happy is, you know, it's kind of too simple of a word, but relationships, um, culture, um, uh, a, a palette for, again, night um, activities, festivals, you know, all of these things add to the joie de vivre of a city. And I think that counts. So I hope I answered that question. I think you definitely did. Okay. Um, Barry, do you have anything to add on the sustainability question? Just that there was a question about New York. We have a right now a whole discussion, to be polite, about uh, what kind of safeguards we need around Manhattan, whether to build walls, whether to have more green infrastructure, the side that I'm on, um, and it had different ways of providing resilience. Uh, Several of the sites I showed are waterfronts. So you really have to think about the impact of global climate change and how you're going to protect those, those areas. 
Well, and actually, Barry, if you want to go ahead and answer that question, Nancy Plager had that question about, um, you know, that so many walk parks are on the East River in Manhattan and Queens that she'd read something about Hoboken and cisterns below the park yeah. to yeah. go ahead and answer that question. Hoboken uh, is actually low lying and they have taken to take the subjects of flooding and they've tried to do some very sophisticated steps. Both the previous mayor and the current mm -hmm. mayor have been very active. For Manhattan, there was a plan called the Big U that utilized things like Battery Park and East River Park uh, to try to add to resilience as well as walkability. Uh, so it is, uh, you know, um, uh, over the last 30 years, you can now walk around the island of Manhattan and the only place you can't go uh, on the water or next to the water is at the United Nations for security reasons. So you, you know, we've we've tried, we really opened up the waterfront, but we also have to make it trying to find ways to make it more resilient. Okay. So do you think there's a direction in the country to be doing more of this type of protection against particularly storm surges and that oh, kind of thing? Does there seem I, to be more of that going on? Absolutely. You can think about the LA River. You can uh, a city like Toledo, uh, uh, on the on Lake Erie, and uh, oh, there are so many other places where they are trying to provide flood protection, but it also places that are the public realm and that uh, can make it through a storm. Okay. Okay. Um, sort of leading out of the sustainability question, Vilma had a question for you, Bernadita, if you can share some of your data around um, climate change um, that you're working on. Um, I don't know if I read the question right. Vilma, if you wanted to ask the question directly to Bernadita, it sort of comes out of the sustainability issue. Oh, I'm not sure. Um, you have a unique perspective for city. For city officials is to look at different uh, ways to contribute to climate change. Did you want to add to something about that? You want to give some information on that, Bernadita? Well, I I mean, when it I, the only thing I can think of right now is what what we're doing in our project where um, where we are building this navigation tool, but. At, but uh, as part of the tool is it tells you how how much carbon footprint you know you have and how much you've saved but in terms of government officials i i i, I think that the the challenge is um with government and and public private partnerships so uh public and private partnerships because like they say that in in the success of the US was not really based on just government alone it was really the the private sector that pushed it so i think if there's more stronger partnership then both the climate change public realm anything can can be made possible because it we did it in the past that you know we cannot rely on government we all have to work together yeah okay okay thank you um, so I think some of this was addressed, um, Lenny, in your presentation, but I wanted to find out if anyone wanted to add to this issue of how does safety and security influence your work. So, Lenny, did you want to add anything more to that topic? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, safety is, is sort of the absolute bottom line, just like saving energy is. In other words, these are the threshold that we work from. And um we have to be clear when we talk about safety there's kind of two parts to that and i always believe in like clarity and definition so safety in terms of co collisions mostly with cars um 75 percent of america's fatalities happen after dark um so that that leads to both lighting and road design um to to help solve that and then there's i guess what we might call personal security which is also safety is it safe to walk around here um that you know i think has some deep roots um in terms of 
you know, education, um, um, you know, uh, a lot, you know, machismo, um, you know, all the various kinds of crimes, assault, you know, rape, battery, um, these sorts of things. I, I, I'm actually what I want to say is the jury is completely out about lighting helping that. So everything I've read, and there, there's a really Irzat's um, pre, um, research piece that's just simply wrong, that says that street lighting helps and in particular ways um, makes areas safe. If you want to know more about it, get in touch with me. Um, basically, we don't know. So we do know a couple of things. Assurance, feeling safe, helps, feeling confident, um, the kind of requisite amount of lighting so that people do feel more confident and they can feel they can get places. Um, also, there was a great study where they basically could not find the difference between night and day crime. And they found that if the streets are taken care of and the light poles are taken care of, that's a sign that cities care about the populace actually crime goes down. So I think it's very interesting. We haven't found a way to do the research and put a tick box on that yet. Okay. So Bernadita, in your data gathering, you have a, a, a measurement of safety and security. Yeah. I mean, for us, uh, we actually uh, have not quite advanced it, but we have gathered data on, on, um, on accidents and, and, um, crime but yeah so for us safety is obviously for walkability is very important it's the absence of injury but then I want to highlight that on top of um, safety when one walks along the sidewalk when one feels secure there are all the other dimensions that I mentioned you know beauty comfort safety is one vibrance ec equity these are all important elements of um of um, equity, for example, is what L Lenny was saying about the different lighting. Most of the lighting in, in cities right now are focused toward the streets, not the sidewalk, because we've given so much importance on the streets. So I think there has to be a, ch a shift right now where if we give more importance to people, then the lighting toward people should be more, more emphasized when, you know, the DOT should think about that as, as a a problem yeah okay well we're getting really close to the end we have so many great questions here i had another question for the group but jacob deeds has been giving wonderful commentary in the chat and he has a question about uh, why aren't vertical gardens being considered in cities um, for green space and food did i say that accurately jacob i'll just answer quickly that they're very successful in singapore but in the Northeast United States, you're not going to have a lot of green in the winter. So they're a little less popular. Uh, there is uh, biophilia. There are kinds of designs that use uh, uh, plants as in a, in, in a way to create a microclimate. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg had a plant a million trees, which is a good idea and a good goal. Um, uh, I'll just make one more comment about security. Uh, I worked on a study called Defensible Space, the study actually the New York City Housing Authority, and it, all the kinds of things such as cameras, policemen, uh, visibility, there's a lot to providing security and a lot of tools that create the feeling that have been were being discussed, but also have the role of actually deterring crime. Okay. Um, just, we had one more question for the group. Um, how do you consider inclusivity and social equity in your practice? Which one of the three of you wants to take that up? Well, if public space should be open to all. Okay. <laughs> and that's part of the idea of the public realm is that all different kinds of people can Correct. go to, to yeah. can share a space. Most of my projects include people actually working on the project. We we have a few projects going in East Harlem and people are, you know, are actually helping to build 
the project. So that is like direct um, engagement. Yeah, it's diverse culture, children, elderly, everybody should be um, part of the public realm. Yeah. Okay, so um, you know we're right at the top of the hour. Um, do, Barry, do, is there anything else you wanted to say before we bring this to a close? It, there was a question about return on investment. Oh, right. If you're talking about public space, um, it's not a real estate investment per se, but you can measure traffic in terms of walk of walking traffic and everybody avoided even talking about cars because we don't want them. <laughs> uh, uh, you can measure the impact on properties such as restaurants and others that benefit from having a lot of activity in the public realm, you know, restaurants, uh, uh, all shops, all kinds of things. So there are ways to measure uh, the impact on the surrounding community and numerous studies that show that being the value of a building on, say, a central park is higher than one that's not. Okay. Thank you, Barry. Um, Lenny, did you want to say anything else before we close this? Well, just the ROI is also very directly um, associated with street lighting. I, you know, we do more than just street lighting. We do creative lighting. But um, the conversion to LED, the purchasing back of street lights from utilities, there's a whole sort of um, process that's going on really rippling across the country. And cities feel that also then adding the smart element that I talked about, you know, um, gives them uh, some abilities that they never had before. So therefore, the return on investment is, you know, smoother city services, uh, more clarity on um, the metrics of, of environmentalism, in a sense. Um, and if you add light, actual lighting in, you know, more, more safety, um, assurance and feeling of belonging. Excellent, excellent. Um, Bernadita, do you have a closing? Well, mm -hmm. well, in in terms of that, I think I just want to go back to the High Line because they invested some, expecting millions of dollars in revenue, and they ended up with billions of dollars in revenue, and that's because they created a corridor park that allowed um, people to come in and spend a lot of money, made made it a mixed use of residential office. Uh, commercial and and restaurants and all. So I think the mixed use is very important. But so I think it goes back to really paying attention to what we have in terms of our corridors and see what we can do with it because it there's evidence that it's been done and it brought a lot of benefit. Yeah. Well, this was a fabulous panel. I, I This is probably one of the first ones I've done where there's so many lingering questions to go on, but I know that the Global Chamber needs this room for other um, Globinars or webinars. So we hope to have um, everyone back and, uh, you know, anyone who's on this call, including speakers who are not yet members, please consider becoming a member. We'll be reaching out to you soon on that. Uh, Bernadita, thank you so much for helping me organize this. I thought it was excellent. And Please make sure um, to share your information right now in the chat, um, the three speakers, so everyone can get in touch with you. Um, and if for some reason um, any of the attendees don't capture it, just reach out to me, nyc at globalchamber.org, and I'll be happy to share information for Barry, Lenny, and Bernadita. And also, this has been recorded, so it will be available later if you know any of the information um, would be important to you. So. Um, Thank you all yeah. very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Happy upcoming Thanksgiving. And Pranima, I was glad you were able to sign on. I know you're having some issues. And, and Jacob, thanks for all your um, intera interactive conversation going on in the chat and to everyone else. Love that. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Susan. Bye, everybody. Thank